Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to virtual uh, workshop at ITS. ITS represents Initiative for Theoretical Sciences at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. As a faculty member, I have been running workshops on theoretical and computational chemistry for many years. But uh, because of COVID-19, the workshops be uh, started becoming virtual uh, this year. And on the other hand, Chris Bardin and I have been, I have organized a Telluride workshop on extons. And it was supposed to happen last summer, but of course it was postponed because of COVID-19. And considering the importance and also urgency of um, the topic, we thought that it was would be nice to invite the speakers for the Telluride workshop for this um, ITS virtual Zoom workshops. And then we organized three uh, different two hour workshops. And this is the second one. And the title of today's workshop is Extons at Different Length Scales and Dimensionality. Let me introduce our first speaker, Will Tisdale from MIT. All right. Thanks, Dougie. Thanks, Chris, for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to see so many friendly faces here. I'll be talking here uh, about some of our work um, really over the past almost 10 years now, studying non-equilibrium transport behavior uh, in low dimensional semiconductors. So my group has studied a variety of semiconductor nanomaterials from quantum dots to uh, two-dimensional semiconductors, transition metal ditrocogenides. We've done a lot of work recently in halide perovskites, um, but I want to revisit some older work because I still think it's very relevant, uh, our work that we've been doing in quantum dot assemblies for, for many years now. Um, quantum dots are, are really intriguing materials. They're a great play system for testing theories of exciton and charge transport because we have so much synthetic tunability of these materials in terms of their size, their size dispersity, uh, the surface functionalization, the electronic coupling between neighboring sites. Uh, it's really a system that you have tremendous um, synthetic control over uh, and uh, we've, had a, we've had a blast studying these materials. They self-assemble into an array of ordered structures. Um, but if you want to get good electronic or uh, charge transport or exciton transport in these, you need to increase the strength of electronic coupling. And so the native um, long chain fatty acid ligands typically that are coating the nanocrystal surfaces that impart colloidal stability after you deposit them into the film, those need to be exchanged for shorter ligands to increase the strength of electronic coupling. Uh, as a result of that ligand exchange process, um, varying degrees of spatial and energetic disorder are introduced into the films. Depending on how you do the ligand exchange, you can maintain short range order, but disrupt long range order or have a more continuous film, but with a lot more local disorder. And very early on in my research career, I became really interested in the effect of disorder on transport uh, and really trying to nail down the, under, the microscopic dynamics of charges and excitons in these disordered arrays. And so one of the questions that um, we started asking when I was a postdoc in, in Vladimir's group uh, is can we directly visualize exciton transport? We tried a variety of different approaches, and the approach that gave us the most success was time-resolved photoluminescence microscopy. There are a, a lot of people that had a hand in this work. Um, first and foremost, Gleb Axelrod, who was a PhD student in Vladimir's group at the time I was there as a postdoc, and then continued there after I started my independent re, um, career in the chemical engineering department at MIT. Um, Ferry, Parag, uh, Vinan, Vladimir, um, all these people played a hand in, in developing this approach. Um, my group specifically, our role in this really was heavily on the mathematical analysis side and trying to understand the information content in the technique and how do we process the information to extract um, microscopic insight from this type of data. So the first iteration of this technique, it looks something like this. You take a short pulse laser, pulse pick it down to lower frequency, frequency double it uh, to the blue in this case couple it into a single mode optical fiber to get good mode quality. And then you couple that into a uh, oil immersion objective to get a diffraction limited excitation spot in your sample. 
Then you collect the epi photoluminescence. And then what we did that was a little bit different from standard approaches is you take that epifluorescence, you project it out the side of your mac microscope, you use a much longer uh, focal length uh, relay lens such that you spatially magnify your photoluminescence spot. Um, and then at the time, we did not have uh, fast enough cameras to resolve uh, this, this movie on fast enough timescales, but we do have very fast single point detectors. Uh, and so the approach that Gleb and Vinod and Parag came up with was to take a single point detector, a fast single point detector like an APD and scan it across the magnified photoluminescence image. And as, instead of shooting the movie of exciton diffusion, in uh, frame by frame, as you would a normal movie, you shoot the movie pixel by pixel and then stitch back together uh, all those spatial information frames uh, later in post-processing. The first time we, we used this approach, it was in tetracine single crystals, which have long triplet exciton diffusion lengths. Um, the broadening of the spatial distribution was quite dramatic in this case. So every slice through here is a uh, spatial profile as a function of time, increasing a one-dimensional profile. It broadens with a well-defined diffusivity that you can measure and you can analyze and extract information. When we set out to do these same measurements in cadmium selenide quantum dot solids, the magnitude of the spatial broadening was much less dramatic. Um, as you can see here, rather than very uh, dramatic micron scale diffusion lengths, we have uh, likely exciton diffusion lengths on the order of 10 or 20 nanometers or so, um, as we expected from just calculations at the Forster rate. Uh, nonetheless, the broadening is statistically significant and it can be analyzed. Uh, and so what does that analysis look like? Well, if you had some delta function initial conviction with infinitesimal spatial precision, the uh, time dependent distribution would be a Gaussian function whose width increases in time. And what we realized is that you could actually use this same approach to model any arbitrary initial condition. Uh, any distribution at, at any time t can be expressed as a convolution of any arbitrary initial excitation distribution with the Green's function solution. In this case, it's a Gaussian, that time dependent Gaussian. If your initial distribution is also Gaussian, then the math gets particularly easy. Uh, the variance at some time t is just your starting variance plus a term that grows linearly in time due to exciton diffusion. And really what you want to be looking at is the change in the variance of the distribution or otherwise known as the mean squared displacement. And if you manipulate your data in this way, uh, we showed that in principle, the initial size of the distribution does not matter. Of course, in practice, it does. Um, the finite uh, spatial the diffraction limit uh, limits the ultimate spatial precision with which you can make the measure. This mathematical formula assumes that you have infinite signal to noise ratio. Of course, in practice, you don't. You need a bright emitter if you're going to do this in a photoluminescence um, framework. You also need a fast lifetime. You know, one of the biggest limitations of signal to noise ratio in the photoluminescence approach is waiting, simply waiting for the system to relax back down to the ground state. So faster em emitters allow you to do the experiment more times per second generate good counting statistics and good, good signal to noise ratio. So we did this in a, a variety of cadmium selenide quantum dot solids. We took the same core size uh, and we tuned the ligand length on the surface. We also grew some shells on the surface to tune the rate of electronic coupling. What we're plotting here is the mean squared displacement, the change in the variance of the distribution as a function of time. For a normal Fickian diffusion process, you expect a straight line. And for all three of these samples, what we saw is that the mean square displacement curved over in time, which we characterized as a subdiffusive process. Um, importantly, we could tune the exciton diffusivity. The rate of growth here informs on the diffusivity. Uh, the local slope informs on the instantaneous diffusivity of the exciton population. When we have uh, stronger electronic coupling, you have faster Forster coupling, uh, you have faster diffusivity in these arrays. But a different way of looking at the subdiffusive behavior is to think of it as a time-dependent diffusivity of the exciton population. Initially, the extons are moving fast, and then over time, they slow down. Why is that? Uh, well, through doing um, spectrally resolved transient photoluminescence, we showed that this was due to energetic disorder. That if you imagine this blue is your exciton, uh, is your static site energy disorder in the film, it's some Gaussian distribution. Initially, you photoexcite all sites in the film with equal likelihood. But over time, those excitons will diffuse energetically downhill. Downhill hopping rates are faster than uphill hopping rates until eventually you form a Boltzmann distribution over the disordered site energy landscape. Initially, we call this a subdiffusive transport property, um, a, a substitute subdiffusive transport phenomena. Eventually, we, we realized it was more accurately characterized as non-equilibrium transport. 
A subdiffusive transport process is one that is self-similar over infinite length scales. So it will continue to look subdiffusive as time goes to infinity. In contrast, in this quantum dot system where the origin of uh, slowing diffusivity is energetic disorder, eventually the exciton population will reach equilibrium with the lattice, form a Boltzmann distribution, at which point in time the diffusivity of the system will be constant in time. So one of the questions this led us to ask is, can disorder actually enhance incoherent exciton diffusion? Uh, at the time we were thinking about this, um, a lot of work was being done exploring the effect of uh, disorder on coherent exciton transport. Uh, we were asking the question in the purely incoherent limit. Um, this exciton diffusivity is faster initially than it is at later times. You can think of this initially formed exciton uh, population as having some excess free energy. It's out of equilibrium with its own uh, locally, with its own energy landscape. Um, can that excess free energy be used to do some work to enhance the transport in the system? This question was very difficult to address experimentally, um, but uh, working with Adam Willard's group, um, Adam had developed some kinetic, uh, Adam and Liza, our jointly advised student, um, developed some kinetic Monte Carlo models uh, to investigate this, uh, this behavior. And so we developed um, a KMC model that was benchmarked to our time resolved spectroscopy data. So we believed all the fundamental constants in the system. We start with electron microscopy images. We use those to create spatial maps of, uh, of quantum dots in the system. We assign each quantum dot in the system an energy drawn from a Gaussian distribution, and that has a fixed energy and time. And then we excite quantum dots uh, in this array with uh, equal probability at any site in the film and then watch them propagate in time using just incoherent Forster hopping dynamics. Uh, this is how we uh, analyze the data. What we're plotting here is the relative migration length. So this is the displacement of an exciton in the given experiment relative to the displacement that it would have if it were a completely ordered energy landscape. And plotting this as a function of time t, uh, dimensionless time. This curve here is for the perfectly ordered case. By definition, the perfectly ordered case is the, is the reference case uh, that has zero deviation from the transport in the case of an ordered array. It also has the color green here, which denotes the energy of those sites. And so if we have a polydisperse or a, a heterogeneous energy landscape, the ordered case is exactly at the middle, where all quantum dots are exactly at the middle of the energy distribution. If we take our disordered film uh, and excite only the blue edge uh, of the distribution, we see that initially we have enhanced diffusivity uh, due to rapid downhill energy transport, but that, that lasts transiently. Eventually due to energy dissipation, those uh, excitons relax to lower energy sites and ultimately have lower diffusivity relative to the ordered case. That was what we expected. If we excite the red tail, um, Initially, we have uh, extremely slow diffusivity, but those excitons migrate energetically upward and eventually uh, reach the, the Boltzmann diffusivity as time goes to infinity. The important conclusion, though, was that averaged over all excitons in the system at all time and length scales, uh, exciton uh, energetic disorder is a net negative uh, for transport, that the enhancement of the transport by the excitons at the blue edge is outweighed by the extreme negative effect of the disorder on the excitons at the red edge of the distribution. Nonetheless, the KMC modeling uh, was so useful to us um, and the microscopic insights were, um, were so interesting to us that we began actually fitting all of our experimental data to kinetic Monte Carlo models to try and extract uh, further microscopic insight. So this is a series of experiments we did. This is not time resolved microscopy. This is ultra fast transient absorption spectroscopy, just modeling the spectral dynamics uh, using KMC simulations to try and extract microscopic constants. Um, this is an example of what the type of data we collect looks like. This is a uh, lead sulfide quantum dot solid in this case. So we're in the near infrared region here. Um, ethane file surface treatment to increase the strength of electronic coupling. We're looking at the bleach of the first excitonic transition in the quantum dot. Over time, that bleach recovers back to the ground state. But if you look closely, you see that there's some slight red shifting uh, of that bleach energy as time increases. If you analyze this data uh, according to the average energy of that bleach position, so here every vertical slice is a probe spectrum as a function of time on the x-axis. This white line right here is the ground state absorption spectrum of the ensemble. 
you can see this slight transient red shifting of this bleach feature. If you plot the locus of these points, you can plot the energetic shift as a function of time. There's at early times, there's a fast shift and then a slower shift at later times. And uh, as much as 25 milli electron volts, energy relaxation of the average uh, of the excitons in the system over time. This behavior is completely consistent with uh, incoherent uh, hopping dynamics within a disordered energy landscape. Importantly, when we look at the temperature dependence of this behavior, uh, at room temperature, we have some transient relaxation. Um, and then as we decrease the temperature, the uh, equilibrium relaxation of the carriers in the system goes deeper and deeper. This is exactly what you expect for a Boltzmann distribution over a Gaussian density of states where the expectation value of energy as time goes to infinity is the center of the uh, distribution minus uh, an amount of energy sigma squared over KT. So as you decrease temperature, there's less thermal energy to kick you out of those lowest energy sites and your average exciton is occupying a lower energy site within the ensemble. Importantly, if we compare data from a, with a poly, uh, of a polydispersed batch to a much to our most monodispersed quantum dots, uh, we have narrower transition energies. That makes sense. Less inhomogeneous broadening of the system, uh, and importantly, we see much much lower magnitude of this energetic redshift. This is telling you right away that batch polydispersity is indeed a source of energetic disorder in these quantum dot solids um, that could, in principle, be avoided. Okay, so we started fitting this type of transient redshift data to kinetic Monte Carlo models. Uh, the details are here. Um, we're using the simplest hopping model, just a Miller-Abrahams model, and there's only two fitting parameters, the inhomogeneous line width or the site energy disorder in the system and the hopping rate constant K prime, the attempt frequency. You can see over here on the right, this is uh, an example of the quality of fits for various different size batches of nanocrystals with differing, differing polydispersity. One of the interesting observations we made was that we could improve the quality of the fit uh, if instead of having one diffusing species, we allow for two diffusing species. The idea here is that uh, in these strongly coupled lead sulfide quantum dot solids, uh, the exciton could be splitting up into free electrons and holes, which would be independently diffusing uh, with their own diffusivity. Uh, when we do this type of fitting, we consistently find that one mobile species is 15 times more mobile than the other but we can't say which is which based on the spectroscopy alone. Uh, charge carrier transport measurements and electrical devices suggest that in these lead sulfide quantum dot solids, the hole is more mobile than the electron, but we can't tell that from spectroscopy alone. Okay, so what sort of information do we collect? We can do things like measure the charge transport rate as a function of quantum dot size. This has been a topic that there's been remarkable inconsistency uh, in the literature, uh, depending on how you make the measurement. Uh, some FET mobility measurements say that uh, mobility gets increases as quantum dot size increases. Uh, time resolve measurements tend to say that mobility increases as uh, quantum dot size decreases. So we directly get the hopping, um, the, the hopping rate prefactor. It's fastest for smaller nanocrystals. In, even when you account for the um, shorter distance traveled per hop in smaller quantum dot solids by converting the prefactor to a diffusivity or mobility, uh, small quantum dots still went out in our measurements. You can also do things like uh, inferring the single nanocrystal line width. Uh, so we get the inhomogeneous line width or the site energy disorder from our uh, directly from our KMC model. We measure the total ensemble line width through uh, ensemble absorption and, and uh, emission measurements. And that allows us to infer the homogeneous or single nanocrystal line width. And we can do that both for absorption and emission. We see that these lead sulfide homogeneous line widths are typically twice as large than visible emitting quantum dots like cadmium selenide, indium phosphide, or indium arsenide. Um, and they're strongly size dependent, that the smaller nanocrystals have much larger uh, homogeneous line width, which seems to be dominated by strong coupling to acoustic phonons in these lead salt quantum dots. Okay, one of the most interesting questions that we, that's um, uh, been studied in the quantum dot community is the existence or lack thereof of band-like transport. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the holy grail of, of, of all this quantum dot super lattice work for years and years is can you um, use these quantum dots like building blocks in some sort of um, designer solid whose properties you can 
uh, you can control. And one of the signatures of that could be uh, emergence of band-like transport behavior, where the quantum dots become so strongly coupled that they form delocalized conduction bands. And one of the signatures of this behavior that's been presented in the literature is uh, temperature-dependent mo mobility trends showing increasing mobility with decreasing temperature. So an incoherent hopping process is thermally activated, higher mobility at higher temperatures. For a band-like transport process, your mobility would decrease um, with increasing temperature due to an increase in scattering events. So we did um, the same measurements that I showed before, these transient redshift measurements coupled to the KMC simulations uh, as a function of sample temperature. Uh, here's a collection of the data uh, right here. I won't go through uh, all of the trends in the data, but I will tell you the, the, the overall observations we made. So in typical quantum dot arrays, the mobility decreased with decreasing temperature. That was exactly what we expected for an incoherent site-to-site -site hopping process, thermally activated hopping. However, in the very monodispersed quantum dot arrays, the mobility actually increased with decreasing temperature. So this was surprising, potentially a signature of uh, band-like transport. But in all cases, um, Right, I, sh I should go back. So th this in general would, would be a signature of, of hopping like transport, except that we are still observing transient redshifts in this case. The, obs the observation of a transient redshift at all is an indication of at least a partially incoherent um, hopping process. If you had a fully delocalized solid, uh, then you would have one lowest energy state that would uh, extend over the system. In all cases, this was the most interesting thing. The hopping rate prefactor increased with decreasing temperature. So even in the cases where the mobility decreased with decreasing temperature, the hopping rate factor increased. OK, so the hypothesis that we uh, eventually came up with is that the super lattice, that you actually have a structural transformation. The super lattice is contracting as temperature is reduced, and you have competition between two different factors. You have this distance-dependent factor um, leading to a faster hopping rate as temperature is decreasing because the surface-to-surface -surface separation is getting smaller, is fighting with an opposite trend of the thermal activation energy needed to overcome the site energy disorder in the system. We modeled this behavior and realized that we would only need to have about a one to two angstrom reduction in the quantum to quantum dot separation to explain our experimental data. Uh, that separation is consistent with a thermal expansion coefficient of the ligand layer that's like polyethylene, so something typical for an organic solid. Um, and then eventually we were uh, able to do the temperature dependent GSACS measurements um, at, the, at Brookhaven National Lab on the synchrotron. Uh, the temperature dependent structural transformations are complex and are a subject of a separate paper. Um, but the, the important takeaway here is that the nearest neighbor distance does actually decrease. So what we showed in this work is that um, you can have increasing mobility with decreasing temperature, even in the absence of band-like transport behavior, even in a fully incoherent hopping model, simply due to structural transformation, a very, very small, subtle structural transformation of your quantum dots solid. With that, I'd like to thank uh, all the people involved uh, in the work, um, particularly Adam Willard uh, and Liza Lee, uh, Gleb Axelrod for the um, time result of microscopy work early on, um, Mark and Rachel and Wendy and Ferry uh, from my group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So you can submit uh, questions to Chris. Uh, Chris, why don't you, okay. yeah. Well, I have I have the public, <coughs> sorry, public chat and private chat. So I'm the public chat's empty, empty, but the private chat. I have one question: is uh, can you say something about the role of exciton exciton annihilation, both in the in the interpretation of the experimental results and also how that would affect any exciton diffusion dynamics? I'm sort of paraphrasing the question. Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's a hugely important effect. Um, not sure if I have it in this presentation. No, I don't, unfortunately. Um, no, it is, it is a, it's an extremely important effect. Um, I, I, I had some extra slides I was gonna put at the end of this talk and then cut them out for time. Um, I, I, there's, a, there's, a big, uh, there's a big variation in reported values in the literature for diffusivity in different systems, um, either in quantum dot systems and TMDs in, in perovskites. Um, and one of the trends that I see in the experimental data and how it's collected uh, is that uh, higher, uh, higher laser power techniques uh, tend to report larger diffusivity numbers than lower laser power techniques. We tend to do all of our measurements um, because photoluminescence 
uh, can be done in the single photon limit, you can go to exceptionally low excitation densities. Um, when we do our time resolved imaging um, for the quantum dots, for instance, we're exciting uh, at a rate um, at an excitation probability of one exciton uh, per 100 to 1,000 quantum dots. We don't want the excitons to be encountering each other at all uh, during the course of their lifetime or to have any probability of uh, absorbing multiple photons per quantum dot per excitation event. Um, when you go to very, very low excitation densities, you, you tend to observe very, very low exciton diffusivities, um, which we do too. We don't, we don't observe, um, we don't understand all of the power dependent trends. Uh, they can't all be explained by uh, fluence alone. Uh, the fluence uh, it emerges very clearly from a power dependent series in the data. Um, we've seen that, uh, we've, we published on that extensively in, in TMDs uh, in particular, where you have to go down to excitation densities as low as one exciton per square micron uh, to stop seeing annihilation effects. Uh, but in general, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and I strongly encourage uh, anyone in the field who's reporting uh, diffusivity experiments, time resolved microscopy experiments to report power dependent data, because I think that's a really important parameter. Okay, I, I would agree. Uh, so this is a, a question from, from Suggy, which is to what extent is the Miller-Abrahams rate reliable for gaining appropriate microscopic information? Yeah, oh, only only to a limited extent. Um, I, I, I fully acknowledge that. I mean, we, we were, we were uh, opting for the simplest uh, rate expression that um, that uh, obeyed detail balance, which is the Miller Abrahams expression. Um, you know, if this is uh, excitonic transfer, I mean, so in the in the cadmium selenide quantum dot solid work, uh, we were using we were confident that it was Forster like uh, incoherent dipole dipole coupling. Um, in the case of the lead sulfide quantum dot work, uh, we suspected that we were not in the Forster transport regime, that we were probably looking either at individual charge transport or uh, charge transfer coupling mediated uh, exciton transport, which is why we opted for Miller-Abrahams. Of course, Marcus theory, if you're in an incoherent hopping regime, is uh, probably even more appropriate, but uh, has more fitting constants, and we were trying to go with the, the simplest model um, as possible. question. Uh, what is the experimental limitation in the size of the excitation pulse? How does your result depend on its size? I'm, I'm assuming that means the spatial. Uh, yeah, for the spatial width. Yeah, um, I don't think I... Right, so this is the full width half maximum. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we were diffraction limited in this case. Um, the How does it... it, it it's, it's completely dependent on, on, on sample. Um, uh, as I said, you know, from a mathematical standpoint, there is there is no limit to the spatial precision that can be collected by the technique. In practice, there of course is a, a limit. It's the same principle behind um, uh, behind polymer storm, where your spatial precision is dominated by um, your counting statistics of the photons. How many photons can you collect within the measurement window? We felt uncomfortable um, claiming we could resolve anything below about 10 nanometers uh, in this sample. And these were, these were some pretty bright samples. We have not tried measuring homogeneous and homogeneous line widths uh, independently using four-wave mixing. Um, others have uh, for these quantum dot uh, samples, for these lead sulfide samples, the numbers that we report are consistent um, with uh, um, photon correlation Fourier spectroscopy measurements that the Bowendi group has done. Um, the, uh, it, th those are typically limited to the visible emitting wavelength range. Um, that's not true. They've done great work uh, extending that into the infrared. Um, we have uh, access over a large, uh, over a large range of sizes. Um, and the results that we get from these uh, uh, KMC modeling of our data are consistent with the single nanocrystal measurements. So if I can follow up, so consistent means you could you should you you would be confident predicting exciton diffusion lengths based on someone's photon echo or four wave mixing experiment? Oh no 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 sorry I thought um, <laughs> I misinterpreted the question I I thought you were so I reported on one slide down here um, where are they uh, so our, our homogeneous line widths as a function of quantum dot diameter that we mm -hmm. we we get our incoherent line width from the KMC modeling the total. Mm -hmm. Uh, ensemble and then infer the single nanocrystal alignment. I was saying that these numbers we infer are consistent okay. with um, with single nanocrystal spectroscopy measurements on similar lead sulfide quantum mm -hmm. dots. Um, in terms of how much our model can predict um, exciton diffusion lengths, 
no, I, I don't. I don't feel confident in that at all. Um, I feel confident in our ability to predict exciton diffusivities, uh, but diffusion lengths I think are so heavily affect, uh, oh. affected by trap state densities, um, uh, by more more by the minority carrier lifetime than it is by the diffusivity of the exciton population. Okay. Do we have we have two minutes for Naomi Ginsburg's Naomi Ginsburg's question of uh, what about the impact of heterogeneity on the excitation spot? So very quick experimental question. Heterogeneity on the excitation spot. Um, we, we scan our sample around as we're making the measurement to avoid photo bleaching in any location. So we are um, averaging out heterogeneity. Um, we have not sought to correlate um, local disorder on any length scale. I, I, I will, I mean, there, there was a bit of, um, there was some, some data that I skipped over. Um, so, so, so we have not looked uh, at site-to-site -site variations within the film, um, mostly because we're worried about the experiment itself um, damaging the sample. I guess that's what I'll say. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah, thank you.